Hello again and welcome to construction equipment. Today we're going to talk about uh, estimating equipment cost. Definitely as we have mentioned already in class that cost is one of the major functions that the project management manager is responsible for and today we're going to talk about estimating equipment since this is a construction equipment class. Uh, we're going to learn about what are the different components of the equipment cost and then uh, we're going to talk uh, in some more detail about equipment depreciation, how it is part of the cost component and it has to come in our cost estimates as well. So, uh, building and industrial construction depend more on labor and material. So residential construction, for example, and to a certain extent, commercial construction rely on labor and material, so they are labor and material in intens intensive. Uh, however, heavy construction, highway construction, or heavy civil projects is very much equipment dependent, therefore the equipment cost component is the most predominant one, much more so than labor or even materials. So when you think about a pavement project, for example, or a heavy earthwork project, you're going to find that the cost of the equipment is the predominant cost because there's no cost of material pretty much, the earth is, is already there, so the cost of excavating, the cost of transporting, the cost of compacting, etc., which is predominantly the cost of the equipment with some parts of labor component as well. So construction equipment must earn sufficient revenue to cover the contractor's investment cost, which is the ownership cost and the operating cost. Let's treat equipment like an asset. It is an asset. So the contractor purchases it, purchase it, it to make profit out of it. So uh, we have to account for its cost. We have to account for any expenditure that we make related to the equipment. And hopefully we're going to make a profit out of the utilization of that equipment as well. So the contractors must be able to estimate the uh, ownership and operating costs, O and O, for each piece of equipment that they own. Equipment can be owned, it can be also rented or leased. The contractor does not have to lock his or her money in a, a big asset like equipment. They can rent it or they can lease it. However, the rental cost and the lease cost in some cases might exceed the ownership and operating cost. So there's an advantage of not locking a large uh, amount of capital in equipment, but at the same time you're going to pay a little bit more for that rental. And uh, costs are used to determine rates to charge projects for equipment use, which is going to be charged as part of our bid, and decisions regarding disposal, purchase, rental, or lease of equipment. We need to know at certain points in time, is it going to be better to purchase the equipment and depreciate it along the project, or is it going to be more economical to rent the equipment for a short term, or is it going to be more, equip more economical to lease it for a medium term, not exactly the same length as owning it and not as short as renting it. So when we start talking about equipment, we have two major types of equipment. Uh, that's at least one of the classifications. One of them is that it's production equipment, which is producing units that alone or in combination lead to an end product that is recognized as a unit for payment. So for example, concrete mixers, they produce concrete which can be a part of the bid items that is concrete. Asphalt, same thing, uh, and so on. So including pavers, haulers, loaders, rollers, and trenches that excavate trenches and so on, because the unit, whether it's cubic yard or linear foot or whatever, for the, for the trench excavation, it's an end product by itself, and it's produced by this piece of equipment. So this is the first type, which is called production equipment. The second type is called support equipment, and this is equipment that's still needed for the project, yet it does not produce end units that can be counted as bid items. So it's required for operations related to the placement of construction, such as movement of materials and personnel, and activities that influence the placing environment. These include hoists, or cranes, vibrators, scaffolds, transit mixers, etc. Scaffolds, for example, are going to need it for the project because that's where the labor are going to stand to place concrete or to place uh, uh, masonry or whatever. But you cannot have a pay item in the bid by itself called scaffolds. It's going to be embedded and calculated in the cost of the units where that scaffolding is going to have an effect. 
Now talking about equipment costs, it can be divided into four major components. And these are going to be ownership, operation, including maintenance and repair, overheads, and finally profit, because we need to make profit out of that piece of equipment. So the contractor's accounting system is the best source of information for these figures. Historical data is the best method of determining cost. So we're going to look at historical data for similar projects in the past. How much did we spend on these different parts of that cost? And as you can see, the ownership cost is the predominant part of that cost because purchasing the equipment, that huge asset, is a big bulk. And then the operational cost, including running that piece of equipment, maintaining it, repairing it from time to time, and then any overhead that's going to be charged on that piece of equipment, including, for example, the cost of storage. If that equipment is not being used, where are we going to store it and, and, and keep it safe? And then finally, profit. Uh, we need to charge, again, since it's an asset that the contractor locks his or her money to purchase that asset, they have to get a return on that investment, which is going to be in the form of profit that's going to be charged to the client or the owner. The ownership and operation cost for the equipment ownership costs are incurred whether the equipment is used or not. And think about it this way. If you have a truck and the truck is kept locked in a garage, for example, you, you're not making use out of it. Well, you're not getting any profit, first of all. The value of that car is going to deteriorate with time. Although you have not used it, that's just a fact of depreciation. So you are losing money by keeping it locked. So whether it's working or not, its value is going to decrease. The operating costs, however, are incurred only when the equipment is being used because it's related to the equipment usage, whether it's going to be fuel, uh, grease, filters, maintenance, etc. It's going to be related to the use and the amount of use of that piece of equipment. So parts of ownership costs, we have depreciation, interest, that you have to pay for a loan, for example, to purchase that piece of equipment, taxes, insurance, again, whether you use it or not, storage, and license fees. All of these are part of the operating costs, regardless of whether the equipment works or not. On the other hand, the operating costs include maintenance and repair, which are, as I said, proportional to the use of the equipment, tires, including repair or replacement of these tires, fuel that's going to, use, to be used to run that equipment, service, filters, oils, grease, which are the things that you need to keep replacing on a regular basis. Downtime, we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. And finally, the oper operator, if that equipment has an operator, a driver, or someone who is going to run that piece of equipment, that's going to be part of the operating cost because their cost is going to be only charged if the equipment is being used. That's the major differentiation between ownership and operating. And as you can see here, graphically, the ownership cost goes down with time, whereas the operating cost goes up with time. The older the piece of equipment, the more operating cost is going to have. It's going to require more maintenance, more repairs, etc. Whereas the ownership cost is going to go down because of depreciation. The value of that equipment is going to keep going down until it becomes at least on the books zero. You might have the equipment still functioning, still producing, and in this case, the ownership cost is going to be pretty much nothing. The ownership costs are best estimated by the time value of money analysis method. We talked about the time value of money in the previous lecture. We learned about how to draw the cash flow and the different types of the present value, the future value, the annuities, and so on. So this is one way of calculating the ownership cost. The contractor will know the purchase price and must estimate the ownership period for how long are they planning to own that piece of equipment, whether it's until it becomes totally obsolete and its value becomes zero on the books, or are they going to sell it used and get some residual or salvage value from selling that piece of equipment. This information will account for depreciation. We need to calculate this information to be able to calculate the amount of depreciation that's going to be charged on that piece of equipment every year. The ownership cost is also called the fixed cost because, again, it does not depend on the utilization of the equipment, how many hours or how many days. 
it is time dependent or time related because of the effect of obsolescence or the effect of depreciation as we have seen it goes down over the years it's calculated by relating the estimated total service life in hours to the total total cost of the equipment working during these hours if the equipment is idle for some of those hours cost is taken as part of the general overhead So if the equipment is in use, hourly cost is charged to the project. You're going to estimate how much it cost you per hour as if you were renting it, not exactly at the same price of rental. Because again, here we have another dilemma. What if a contractor owns the equipment and charges the client for the price of rental? Theoretically speaking, the contractor is going to make more money because the price of rental is higher than the cost of ownership. But on the other hand, if that price is too high, the total bid price for the contract is, is going to become too high and the contractor may be out of the competition. So these are the two criteria that we have to balance at the same time. How much are we going to charge the owner in a way that's going to enable us to achieve maximum possible profit and at the same time still be competitive and be able to win the bid. So that ownership cost is going to consist of the two main components estimating the, 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 the for depreciation on the cost of using the equipment and estimates for of allowance for interest insurance and taxes which again as we mentioned before are part of the fixed or ownership cost this is by the definition of the iit the uh, uh, in, in this uh, industry institute construction industry in institute the ownership cost includes interest taxes insurance and storage itis and license costs and these are used to establish the minimum attractive rate of return. Minimum attractive rate of return. The interest is going to be charged for borrowed money or the return expected from invested money, which is the cost of opportunity or the cost of the lost opportunity. If the money is borrowed, you'd have to return it back with an increase that's called interest. If the money is yours, you're going to assume as if you have invested this money in another uh, endeavor and that money is giving you a return on investment. That alternative return on investment you're going to charge it to the owner because you lost that other opportunity by locking your money for that particular project taxes are going to be include the personal property taxes for owning that asset the insurance for general liability insurance to cover damage or injury caused by the equipment and equipment insurance to cover physical damage to the equipment very similar to liability insurance the full coverage that you have on your car if you want to have the peace of mind of if anything happens to my car or my assets going to be replaced then you're going to have the full coverage if only you want to protect against your own mistakes against the others so if you hit someone or if you hit another car that your insurance company is going to pay for the repairs that's going to be the just just the general liability insurance storage is going to be the cost of protecting the equipment when not in use on the project and that's a good practice definitely and finally the license costs which are fees pad for plates and other user permits again the the easiest example is your car you have to pay for the renewal of your license plates every year and for each piece of equipment the equipment manufacturer is going to include a uh, some pages in their user's manual that show you how much to charge for uh, how many hours that equipment is going to be used so if it's going to be used for example 6,000 hours a year, then this is what you're going to charge if it's going to be 5,000, 4,000, 3,000, 2,000, and so on. So it tells you guide for estimating hourly cost of interest, insurance, and taxes based on the number of hours that equipment is going to be used per year. That comes for a Caterpillar contractor. It comes with, within the manual of that, uh, of that uh, piece of equipment, of that tractor. Now let's look at an example here. A contractor has purchased a tractor for $155,000. They're, they're not coming cheap. With an expected useful life of 12,000 hours. 12,000 operating hours, not calendar hours. And estimates, uh, the contractor estimates that its annual usage will be about 2,000 hours per year. So from that, we can expect that we're going to own it for or a service life of six years. That's 12,000 divided by 2,000. The salvage value at the end of the tractor's useful life, which is six years, is estimated to be about 12% of the purchase price, 12% of this 155,000. 
The contractor estimates his ownership cost factors to be the interest is going to be 9%. Everything is related to the purchase price. 9%, the taxes 2%, the insurance 2%, storage 1%, license none. What would be the estimated annual ownership cost if it's operated under average conditions? So again, we need to calculate that total ownership cost and then divide it by the number of service lives, service life years to get uh, that operating cost uh, per year, ownership cost per year. So the expected useful life, 12,000 hours, period of ownership, 12,000 divided by 2,000, that's six years. Minimum attractive rate of return, which is basically the sum of these numbers, nine plus two plus two plus one, that's equal to 14%. The salvage value we mentioned that's gonna be 12% of the purchase price, which is 155,000. So you're gonna be able to sell that piece of equipment at the end of the six years for $18,600. So the present worth of that salvage value today, this is going to be in six years. What is the worth of these $18,000 uh, and, and six hundred today? The present worth of the salvage value is 8,481.6. Subtract the present worth of the salvage value from the purchase price. So this is basically the cost of using that piece of equipment today. Convert to an annual series. You remember when we did that in the previous class by using an annuity based on the present value. So it's going to be equal to $37,655.23. Therefore, the cost per hour is going to be that $37,655 divided by 2,000 hours per year, which comes up to eighteen. $83 per hour. So for each hour, this piece of equipment is going to be working, it's going to cost you $18.83. You have now to charge the owner a little bit over and above that to include for your own profit. The operating cost, of, so far we have talked about the ownership cost. Now let's talk about the operating cost. The operating cost is also called the variable costs. And it's a function of a number of operating hours quantity proportional. It's not exactly time related because again, if the equipment is kept locked or unused, there is no operating cost. There is ownership cost on the other hand. So it's quantity proportional. It includes fuel, lubricants, and other consumables, filters, tires, etc. Maintenance, overhauls, and repair, and operator's wage, including fringes. Again, remember here when we talk about, for example, a uh, 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 crane operator getting uh, $50 an hour. The $50 an hour are not exactly the cost of that crane operator because you're going to charge more for that. There's going to be uh, insurance, workers' comp, uh, taxes, uh, social security, etc. So, and the other benefits. So, basically, it might be something like maybe $80 an hour. So, that's the exact, that's the actual cost of that labor. The best source of data for estimating operating costs is from historical records. Again, looking at our track record, how much did it cost in the past. The next best source is to use cost factors provided by equipment manufacturers for the specific equipment. As we have seen in that book on Caterpillar uh, tractor, they're going to give you some indices on how much to calculate for that cost. That's if you do not have any historical information. So the operating costs can are generally influenced or greatly influenced by the age of the equipment. Of course, the older, the more it's going to cost you because it's going to require more repair, more uh, replacement of consumables. Its state of repair and maintenance, if you keep it in good condition, it's going to cost you less. If you abuse it, it's going to cost you more. And its operating conditions, again, if it's working in a very harsh environment, that's going to need more upkeep cost. If it's working in normal conditions, then again, that cost is going to be reduced. Maintenance and repair costs are roughly estimated by using a percentage of the annual straight line depreciation amount. Uh, there's going to be a table that provides factors to be used to estimate hourly maintenance and repair costs, again, depending on the type of equipment. Since the factors are based on 10,000 hours of operating hours, they must be adjusted. So the uh, hourly repair cost 
is going to be the equipment repair factor from the table uh, times the useful life in hours times the hourly depreciation rate divided by 10,000 hours or divided by 10,000. Let's see an example on that. So here is the table for example it shows equipment repair factors based on a 10,000 hour useful life. If the number of uh, useful uh, hours is going to be more than that, the, the equation has to be ad adjusted. So it uh, gives you here, based on the different types of equipment, if it's a bottom dump uh, without the tires, under favorable conditions, then the repair is going to be 30%. Under average conditions, it's going to be 35%. Unfavorable conditions, it's going to be more 45%. For general contracting, a, a, a crawler tractor is going to cost that much. For quarrying, which is more abusive, is going to cost that much. Haulers, loaders, scrapers. So for different types of equipment, it can give you percentages on the uh, equipment repair factors. The tire costs, tires are treated as a separate operating cost. As they have a different useful life than the equipment. The equipment might be uh, working for seven years, ten years, ten thousand hours, twenty thousand hours, but definitely the tires are not going to serve for that whole period. They have to be replaced regularly. Track replacement for track mounted equipment is included in the maintenance and repair cost. Tires are subtracted from the purchase price when determining ownership cost. So when you have, and we're going to see an example of that. A separate cash flow analysis is performed for the tires when are you going to buy them for how much when there are they going to be replaced and and so on and we're going to use a table to estimate the tire life with the table uh, data and tire cost develop a cash flow analysis to know again whether you're making profit on that piece of equipment or not tire maintenance and repair is going to be 15 percent of the hourly straight line depreciation for the tires so let's look at the table here Again, it shows for different types of equipment under different operating conditions what would be the service life of the tires. So for haulers, for example, under average conditions, the tires are going to serve for 3,200 hours. Whereas under unfavorable conditions, you lose 1,000 hours. That's quite a lot. Fuel consumption. The rate of fuel consumption for equipment varies with the Rated horsepower, the higher the horsepower, the more uh, fuel thirsty is going to be. And the duty cycle of the engine, the percentage of the time the engine is operating at maximum output, which varies with each piece of equipment and the operating conditions. Again, if you're working in harsh conditions, for example, you're going to have more fuel consumption, whereas if you're working in more favorable conditions, it's going to be less fuel consumption. Think about it again. To simplify things, think about it as your own car. The hourly fuel cost is going to be the flywheel horse horsepower time fuel factor time the fuel cost. And for the fuel factor, we again, each piece of equipment is going to have its own tables that can be used for that. So again, here for different types of equipment, and we have two columns, one for average conditions and one for unfavorable conditions. And then we have the two different types of, uh, of uh, fuel, gasoline and diesel. By the way, these numbers are relatively old. They come from an old, old manual. And these have to be updated to reflect the increase in fuel prices. Of course, these prices are not valid right now because, as we have seen just in the past couple of weeks or so, the uh, gas prices have gone up. So it, it fluctuates from month to month, from year to year and so on. But in general, the trend is going up. Servicing cost. Again, to keep the, con the equipment in a good condition, you have to maintain it. You have uh, to spend some money to keep it in good condition. Filter, oil, and grease costs are estimated as a percentage of the hourly fuel cost. It again depends on the number of hours of operation of the equipment. So again, here we have a table that shows for different operating conditions what would be the, the equipment service factor as a percentage of the hourly fuel cost. Downtime. We have already mentioned in class something about 
that piece of equipment working 50 minutes an hour or 45 minutes an hour or 55 minutes an hour or 30 minutes an hour this is called downtime downtime is considered by using an operating factor when determining productivity rates this operating factor also known as efficiency factor is a percentage equal to the amount actual number of minutes per hour the equipment is working and not idling so the productive number of minutes per hour sometimes you need uh, a few minutes to adjust the equipment to orientate it or to for the to start it up to warm it up or to cool it down and things like that this is not productive time but it counts as part of the total duration the equipment is working so it reduces the productivity of that equipment we would say in this case that if the equipment works or produces 45 minutes of one hour that's 45 over 60 so the efficiency of that piece of equipment or the operating factor is 75 percent there's no equipment that works at 100 percent efficiency so the skill here is to maximize that efficiency we know we're not going to be able to reach 100 percent but at the same time we don't want it to be 30 percent or 20 percent that would be a lot of loss and finally the labor cost for the operator must be estimated using local wage rates and fringe per percentages and again uh, the human resources department in your company is going to know about that and they're going to be responsible for giving you the numbers for the labor cost the hourly wage rate plus the cost of fringe benefits including vacation retirement insurance uh, whether it's health insurance and so on uh, workers comp any other uh, fringe benefits will have to be added to the labor cost now let's look at an example contractor has, has purchased a wheeled loader wheel loader means we're going to have tires for one hundred fourteen thousand dollars and plans to use it about two thousand hours per year the contractor anticipates disposing of the loader after using it for six years so the estimated total number of hours is twelve thousand hours and realizing a salvage value of thirty five thousand dollars six years from now tires tires for the loader cost four thousand for a set of four quite expensive and the brake horsepower rating of the loader's diesel engine is 105 horsepower the operator will earn $35 an hour including fringe benefits and diesel fuel costs $1.2 per gallon as you can see these are old prices right now it's close to $4 a gallon at the minimum attractive rate of return of 12% what are the contractors hourly ownership and operating costs for the loader so let's break down this information into smaller pieces and take it step by step to calculate what we need to know first of all as we have mentioned we're going to subtract the cost of the tires from the purchase price of the equipment so we have total purchase price 114,000 the cost of the tires 4,000 therefore the cost of the equipment we're going to consider it as 110,000 So the purchase price less tires 114,000 minus 4,000 that's 110,000. The ownership cost is going to be the annual ownership cost plus labor cost plus operating cost plus repair cost. And what we have here at the bottom is a cash flow for that equipment. So we have a purchase price minus the tires at the beginning and then six years later we have a salvage value and in between we're going to assume we have annual cost which is going to be like an annuity. I would like you to, to try to work on that uh, problem at home and show me your answer and I'll be glad to discuss it in class or we can discuss it one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Just follow the instructions and follow the tables that we have used. It's a very straightforward problem. Now we're going to move to uh, overheads which are added to the direct operating cost. These include allowances for general overhead expenses uh, and project overhead expenses. General overhead expenses like, for example, you have a headquarters and you are renting a building and you have telephone costs, stationery, heat, rent, cost of idle equipment, uh, etc. All of these are general overheads or administrative overheads. And at the same time, you also have indirect costs 
on the project itself, including the salary and the cost of the superintendent, the project manager, a secretary on site, a security guard, maybe a temporary fence around the site, maybe a temporary access road. All of these are considered as overheads because they are not part of the permanent construction. And you cannot pinpoint any particular cost item for the cost of the project manager, for example, the salary of the project manager. The project manager is not going to uh, lay bricks or uh, pour concrete or erect steel and so on. He's going to be supervising the whole operation. Therefore, the salary of the project manager has to be absorbed by all of these different pay items in the bid. Finally, profit. And that would vary from one company to another and would vary from one market to another based on the current market conditions and based on the competition. So it's a percentage of the markup which is added to provide for an income or profit element because again, you have money locked in that piece of equipment. You need to have a return on that investment in the form of that profit. That ends our first part of the lecture talking about the different costs, components of ownership, operation, overheads, and profit. And now we're going to focus on equipment depreciation. How does that affect the cost of the equipment? And how are we going to calculate the depreciation? What are the different methods for the calculation of depreciation? So first of all, what is depreciation? It is the decrease in equipment book value due to its usage or due to time. So if you have purchased a piece of equipment today, brand new, it costs you $200,000. You have used it for a year. Then it has lost part of its value because of the consumption of that equipment, the wear and tear. On the other hand, if you kept this piece of equipment brand new, locked in a storage area, and try to sell it one year later, the price is going to drop down again. Why? Because of relative obsolescence. There's got to be a new model with new features and so on. Same thing again as your car. Think about your car as a piece of equipment. Most of the cars, unless it's, an, it's considered as an antique car or something like that, don't watch these shows on, on TV, but regular cars, the one that you and I drive, if you use it, you're going to lose money. If you don't use it and keep it garaged, you're still going to lose money. So you lose either way. It's an expense that can be deducted from revenues, resulting in lower taxes. Now, this is the positive aspect of depreciation. Since the value of your asset has decreased, you have to pay less taxes on that asset. The resulting tax savings can be used to replace the equipment. So, instead of saying, okay, I have a tax break because of the age of that piece of equipment, so I'm going to use these savings to go on a trip, for example. No, that's not the purpose of the tax break. The purpose of the tax break is enabling you, enabling you to save some more money so that when this piece of equipment becomes totally obsolete, you would be able to replace it with these savings. That's the major purpose of these tax breaks due to depreciation. As we mentioned, it's caused by wear and tear, deterioration, obsolescence, or reduced need. And the depreciation determines the decline in market value during time periods. So if I want to know, for example, at the end of the third year, what is that piece of equipment worth? How much has it depreciated? I should be able to determine that. Determines the depreciation amount to use in replacement decision analysis. So knowing how much by how much has the equipment depreciated and what's the book value, when am I going to be able to save enough money to replace that piece of equipment? That's going to come from these calculations. It's also used to evaluate the tax liability. How much taxes do you have to pay? And realistically reflects the asset and the liability of a company. This is something related to accounting and bookkeeping when maintaining the assets and liability columns. Depreciation is going to come into play there. There are four different methods to calculate depreciation. Which one are you going to follow? Either one is fine. Any of these four methods is, uh, is fine. Each one has its pros and cons. We're going to learn about that in a minute. So there we have something called a straight line depreciation method, which is the most straightforward, the easiest one to calculate. Some of the years method, declining balance method, and finally, production method. Production method depends on the equipment is going to depreciate depending on 
how much use you actual usage have we used it for so for example you'd say all right in the first year I drove my car 30,000 miles but in the second year I drove it only 5,000 miles should the depreciation be the same no in this case according to the production method it's going to depreciate more during the first year because you drove it more and less during the second year because you drove it less so let's look at each one of these four different methods and see what it entails how to make the calculations and make some comparison to, between them the straight line depreciation method depreciates the equipment value equally in each of the years the equipment is owned so regardless of how much you have used it as long as you have owned it for a year there's a fixed amount of depreciation for that year it doesn't vary between the first year and the last year of the life of that equipment it's exactly the same amount so n r is the annual depreciation rate we're going to learn about that in a minute n is the number of years the equipment is owned so r is the reverse of n it's 1 over n if you're going to piece that own that piece of equipment for 6 years then r is equal to 1 over 6 if you're going to own it for 10 years r is going to be 1 over 10 if you're going to own it only for 2 years then r is going to equal to 1 over 2 d is the annual depreciation amount in dollar uh, amount p is the purchase price and f is the salvage value at the end of n years again if you're going to own this equipment for six years and then sell it then you're going to get some money at the end of six years that's the salvage value which is f therefore the depreciation the annual depreciation amount the actual amount you have to deduct for depreciation is equal to r times p minus f r times p minus f the book value equipment value at the end of each year after the annual depreciation has been subtracted so at the end of the first year what's my equipment worth at the end of the second year which would be bv2 the book value at the end of year two bv4 at the end of year four etc so bvm is equal to bvm minus one the previous year minus dm the book value at year m let's say at year five is equal to the book value at year 4 minus the amount of depreciation for year 5 which in, in case of straight line is going to be the same dm d1 is equal to d2 is equal to dm it's exactly the same so book value m is the book value in year m bvm minus 1 is the book value at the year m minus 1 and dm is the annual depreciation amount again in straight line method that amount is the same regardless of the year and this is the graphical representation of the straight line method as you can see it's a straight line we start with the purchase price and we end with the salvage value and we depreciate the price of the equipment over the years in this case for example the service life of that equipment is five years we depreciate it over the years and that amount would be the annual depreciation amount so it's three thousand dollars per year as you can see from the graph again an example is going to make things very clear a contractor purchased a grader for two hundred fifty thousand dollars so P is two hundred fifty thousand and plans to use it for six years N is six years the estimated salvage value is sixty thousand F is 60,000 using the straight line method of depreciation accounting what is the annual depreciation amount of and the book value of the equipment at the end of the third year so M is equal to 3 let's look at the application of the equations R the annual depreciation rate these are the equations here D annual depreciation amount which is R times P minus F the book value at year M is BVM minus 1 minus DM so book value at the end of year 1 book value at the, the year 0 which is the purchase price minus depreciation at year 1 book value at the end of year 2 is the book value of year at the end of year 1 minus depreciation book value at year 3 book value at year 2 minus depreciation let's look at the numbers we said that the service life is going to be six years therefore r is the reverse of n reverse of n one over n so it's 0.167 
The annual depreciation amount is R, uh, D equals R times P minus F, which is 0.167, that factor, times the purchase price, 250000 minus 60000 the salvage value, which is 190000 and that gives us $31,666.67 per year. The value of that equipment is going to go down by that fixed amount every year. The book value, BVM, BVM minus 1 minus DM. So at the end of year 1, the book value at the purchase price, 250000 minus the depreciation for year 1, 31000 So the book value at the end of year 1, 218333 at year two, we're going to start with the book value of the previous year, 218,333 minus 31,666, which gives us 186.666. At the end of year three, which is what we're looking for, we're going to start with 186 minus 31,666, which gives us $155,000 value of that equipment at the end, the book value of the equipment at the end of year three. Very straightforward, very easy. So here's a table that shows the value of that equipment, the book value at the end of each year, up till the time you sell it at the end at the salvage value, which is the 60000 And as you can see, the depreciation amount does not vary with the years. It's the same every year. That's the straight line method. A second method, which is called the sum of the years method. In this case, we do not have a fixed amount for the depreciation. It varies from one year to another. The annual depreciation rate differs for each year. In this case, the annual depreciation rate is equal to N minus M plus 1 divided by sum of the years. What does that mean? N is the number of years the equipment is owned, the service life of that equipment. In the previous example, it was 6. M is the specific years in which depreciation is being determined. So in the previous example, we wanted to know what's the book value at the end of the third year. In this case, M would be equal to 3. SOY, which is the sum of the years, is the sum of the years that equals N plus N minus 1 plus N minus 2 and so on, which is sort of the factorial of, of N divided by 2. So the sum of the, the years is equal to N times N plus 1 over 2. Remember this equation. And the annual depreciation amount, very similar to the previous uh, uh, example, straight line, DM equals RM times P minus F. So the sum of the years is already incorporated in the RM, and therefore DM becomes same equation as with the straight line. The annual depreciation amount is the annual depreciation rate times purchase price minus salvage value. Looking at the same example with exactly the same numbers, 250,000, six years, salvage value 60,000. Now we're going to use the sum of the years method and see what's the value of that equipment at the end of the third year. Let's go back a couple of slides here. At the end of the third year, according to straight line, the value was $155,000. Remember that. And the depreciation amount per year was 31,666.67. Now let's see, according to the sum of the years, how are these numbers going to differ. Notice here that at the very beginning, the depreciation amount is really high. And then it starts going down and down and down. So the sum of the years, again, N equals 6, so SOY equals 6 times 6 plus 1, 7, divided by 2. So 6 times 7 over 2, that's 21. Now, RM is equal to N minus M plus 1, divided by SOY. N, 6, M at the end of third year, 3, plus 1, divided by SOY, which is 21. So 6 minus 3 plus 1, divided by 21, that's the rate that we're looking for for the third year which is 0 0.1905 the depreciation amount is that factor 0 0.1905 which is going to vary again from one year to another 
times purchase price minus salvage value. So 0 0.1905 times 250,000 minus 60,000, and that gives $36,190.48. Compare that again with the number that we got from here, 31,666.67. You will find that the sum of years gives a higher uh, depreciation rate at still at year three. Year four is going to be less. Uh, and the book value here is equal to $114,285.70. In the previous example, I believe it was 115. Oh, it was 155. So again, the book value is much less in this case. Which means you're going to pay less taxes. So you have a higher depreciation rate and that's going to enable you to have lower taxes to pay for the equipment. That's one of the benefits of using the sum of the years method. The third method is called declining balance. Declining balance also assumes that you're going to have a higher depreciation at the beginning, lower depreciation at the end. Looking at the same example that we've been giving, your car. If you purchase a used car, the difference between a 2007 and a 2008 model is not going to be that much. Of course, the 2008 is going to be more expensive, but the differential is going to be small. Compared to a 2011 from a 2012, as they always say, you lose about uh, maybe 10% of the value of your car in the first 15 minutes. If you drive it out of the lot of the car dealership for five miles, you lose about one-tenth of the value of that car because it's already a used car. So the depreciation at the very beginning is very high and then it keeps on going down as the equipment becomes older. When applied to uh, equipment purchased secondhand, if you buy a used equipment, it assumes that the initial value is 150% of the straight line rate. And for new equipment, the rate is calculated by dividing 200% by the number of service life years. So that's why it's called sometimes double declining balance, that you assume that the value of the equipment is 200% of, of its value if it's calculated at the straight line method. We're going to see a numerical example on that as well. Just graphically looking at a declining balance or double declining balance and straight line, if you can see here, the amount of depreciation for the straight line is fixed. The height of each step is exactly the same for the service life of the equipment. Whereas in case of declining, double declining balance, huge depreciation the first year, a little bit less the second year, less the third year. By the fourth year, it's much less than the straight line. So again, that enables you to deduct a lot of the value of the equipment at its early service life. Now for the calculations of the declining balance, the annual depreciation rate is applied each year to the remaining book value. The annual depreciation rate is X over N. In the previous examples, we had 1 over N. Now here we have X over N. That's the major difference. That X is, it can range anywhere between 1.25 to 2. We mentioned that for new equipment, it's going to be 2. For used equipment, it's going to be in a good condition, it's going to be 1.5. In a not so good condition, it might be as low as 1.25. N is the number of years the equipment is going to be owned. And the actual uh, annual depreciation amount is going to be the book value at that year, minus 1 times R. So again, same example, just to have a comparison. 250,000, 6 years, 60,000. And we need to know uh, at the end of the third year. Now, assuming that when the contractor purchased that piece of equipment, was it new or was it used? Let's see. It says assume X is 1.5, which means it was used. Because if that equipment was purchased new, then X would be equal to 2. So based on this information, let's see how we're going to calculate the, the depreciation rate. R equals 1.5 over 6, X over N, which is equal to 0 
So the depreciation rate is 0.25 and that's fixed. However, the depreciation amount is going to vary. Again, if you look at it this way, at the very first year, very high depreciation rate, which is based on this equation. The book value at year M minus 1 divided by uh, times R. So in this case it was the uh, 250,000 which is the book value at year M minus 1, year 0 uh, times R which is 0.25 which means 250,000 divided by 4 gave us the depreciation amount 62,500. Subtracting that amount from the, from the book value at year 0 which was the 250,000 gives us a book value at year 1 of 187,500. We're going to use that book value at year 1 to calculate depreciation at year 2, the, the value at year 2 to calculate depreciation at year 3, and so on. And look at this. We started with a depreciation rate of, a depreciation amount of $62,500 by the end of year 1. And look at this. At the end of year 6, it's $56. Negligible. So we have already consumed all of the, that piece of equipment. Okay. So again, here, here's an example between buying a piece of equipment, using it for five years. If it's purchased new, then 200% is going to be divided by five years, giving 40% every year. If it's purchased used, we're going to use 150%. So 150% divided by 5 years gives 30% every year. And based on the value of equipment, we're going to calculate the uh, depreciation for each year. And as you can see, it's dropping down very quickly. The last method, which is the production or use method, it's very simple. It's not a function of age of the asset. For a specific year, the depreciation depends on the amount of asset usage in that year. So, if we're going to purchase that piece of equipment for 250000 sell it in six years for 60000 and we know we're going to use it for a total of, let's say, 100,000 hours or 10,000 hours, whatever number of hours. We're going to have a proportion of that for each year. If I use it for 2,000 hours per year, the cost per hour is that much, so the depreciation for that year is that much. If I use it more in the second year or less in the second year, the depreciation can go up or down. In all the other examples, we found that the depreciation either was straight line, equal, or it started going down as in the sum of years or in the declining balance. Here, however, we have the exception it can go up because if you use it more, the depreciation amount can go up. So here is an example. At the end of year zero, we did not use it. That was the book value. And this is the salvage value. So the consumption is going to be 100,000. We uh, used, we produced 2,800 cubic yards. So 2,800 times 10, which is the cost per hour, gave us 28,000. So the equipment value dropped by 28,000. The following year, we only used 1,600 cubic yards, so which means a certain number of hours. Therefore, the consumption was 16,000, less than the previous year. And then the third year, we used it more, so the consumption went up, the depreciation went up as well, and so on. It can go up or down depending on the amount of usage, and that's why it's called the usage. method. There's another concept that's called amortization of the equipment. Amortizing the equipment comes from more, M-O-R-T, which means dead. That's a Latin word. So uh, the practice, we, we're going to assume that we're going to consume totally that piece of equipment with zero salvage value on this particular project. So we bought the equipment new. By the end of the project, that equipment's going to be worthless. Therefore, we're going to charge all of its cost to the client as part of our bid price. So the practice of charging the owner an amount to be used to purchase replacement equipment 
is referred to as amortizing the equipment. We are killing that equipment gradually. Amortization leads to larger revenue, resulting in taxes on the amount charged to the owner to amortize the equipment. So that's sort of an opposite of uh, depreciation. It's again, we're going to assume that the total value of the equipment is going to be used over that particular project. So we're going to charge the whole value of the equipment to that particular project, which is going to result in more receivables from the owner, higher price, which means we're going to have to pay more taxes. Now, renting versus purchasing. There are some advantages to renting and there are advantages to purchasing. Purchasing definitely will give you a lower price per unit for the production that you're going to achieve. However, what are the benefits of renting then? Advantages of renting equipment include, first of all, no large inventory of specialized equipment with infrequent use. So we're not going to buy every piece of equipment that we need. There are some pieces of equipment that we're going to use probably once every other project, once every other year. There's no meaning in keeping that equipment on our books and locking the money in the value, the asset of that equipment. So it would be better to rent it whenever we need it. Continuous access to new and efficient equipment. Again, you're going to rent the state of the art. If there are any new developments in the equipment market, they're going to be reflected in the newer models, whereas your older, older model, if you do not upgrade it or update it, which is going to cost you money, it's not going to be the state of the art. No need for warehouse and storage facilities. You're going to bring it only when you need to use it and return it whenever you don't, so you don't have to keep it stored. Saving on insurance premiums because you do not own that piece of equipment, therefore you don't have to pay the insurance for owning it. And reduced need for maintenance and easier accounting. Easier accounting because very clearly the cost of equipment in this case is going to be the rental price that you pay. We're not going to worry about depreciation or amortization or anything like that. It's just the rental price that you pay. And no maintenance fee, however, uh, no maintenance fee on the other hand because again, you're going to rent it in a good condition, you're going to return it in a good condition. The renting agency is going to service that equipment, is going to maintain it so that next time you rent it again, it's still in a good condition. Going back to the same example, think about going on a long trip and you don't want to overuse your car or you're not sure whether your car is in a good condition or not. Is it going to break down or not? So in this case, you may decide, okay, I'm going to rent. I'm going to rent a car. It's going to be more expensive to rent a car. You know, the, your car doesn't cost you $50 a day or $100 a day, right? So, but on the other hand, you're getting the peace of mind that if anything goes wrong, I'm just going to return that car and I'm going to get a new one. And this car is going to be the latest model. It's going to be well maintained. I don't have to pay any insurance. I don't have to pay any taxes. It's just the rental price that I'm going to be paying. And finally, here is an example on uh, the ownership cost. It shows the different elements that we have talked about so far, and it shows sort of a breakdown of the example that we have discussed at the beginning of this lecture. I hope that in this lecture you've learned about what are the elements of uh, equipment cost, including ownership, operation, overheads, uh, and profit and uh, utilization, including uh, uh, taxes, including permits, etc. And then we learned about how the breakdown of each one of these, how to calculate each one of these. We also learned about the different methods for depreciating the equipment. We talked about four different methods. We looked at a comparison of the four. Uh, it's all on accounting uh, principles, by the way. And the uh, IRS accepts any of these different methods for accounting, all of them are accepted, whether it's going to be straight line or some of the years or it's going to be uh, the double declining balance or the utilization and use method. And then we talked about amortizing the equipment, what do we mean by amortization. And then finally, if we are able to calculate the cost of ownership of the equipment at e every year or based on the number of hours or number of units of utilization, we can easily compare that to the cost of rental and we can make the decision whether it's going to be more economical to rent the equipment or is it going to be more feasible 
to own that equipment and account for all of these differences. I hope you learned about all of these things and I'll be glad to answer any questions when we meet in class. Have a great day.